Our uh, scripture reading this morning is uh, taken from Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to add a few verses on to the end of what was listed in the bulletin. As we were preparing, we realized that we really needed to spill over into the next three or four verses uh, to uh, complete the thoughts of what was being shared there. So, Romans chapter 6, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Are, we are those who have died to sin, so how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. In 1746, John Wesley wrote a letter. Now, it wasn't just a little short, how are you doing, this is what's going in my life kind of letter. It was a rather lengthy letter. In fact, it was a pamphlet. But it was a letter addressed to a fellow by the name of Thomas Church who had questioned him about some Methodist doctrines, some Methodist beliefs. And in it, Wesley wrote basically a pamphlet that was entitled, uh, where he tried to give his understanding of the main doctrines of Methodists. The main doctrines of Methodists. And he wrote these words. He said, our main doctrines, which include all of the rest, are these. Our main doctrines are these, that of repentance, that of faith, and of holiness. And he went on and he used the illustration of a house, of a house to further clarify what he meant. And on the screen this morning, I have a, a thumbnail sketch of what he had to say. The house of salvation that Wesley alluded to, he, he alluded to the porch of the house as being equated to repentance. You're drawing near to the house of God, but you've not entered into the house of God. It's preparation. It's prevenient grace that brings you up the steps and onto the porch. The door of the house is the door of faith that we walk to to enter into the house of God. It's an experience of God's justifying grace that we've been talking about at large for the last three or four Sundays. And finally, the entirety of the house itself is holiness or sanctification. It's going room by room and offering everything that is that portion of your life to God, to be used for God, to be lived, to be handled in accordance to our understanding of the way God would have us live so that all of our life is brought to God is brought to God to be lived 
in obedience, in accordance with his teachings, with his commands. And this is our experience of sanctifying grace, the grace of God continuing to work in our lives, cleaning up, finishing the task of cleaning up that house. Well, up to this point in the book of Romans, we've been talking about, first of all, the need for repentance. The Apostle Paul wrote about how that no, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is that need for repentance. There is that need to step onto the porch of the house. He's spoken about the way of justification, how to enter in through that doorway. The just shall live by faith, he said, that there is a righteousness that is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. But finally, in chapter 6, now Paul is ready to enter into another area of conversation. I told my wife this morning we're going to be stepping into some deep waters this morning. He talks about sanctification. He talks about the act of being dead to sin and alive to Christ. That's the way he explains sanctification in this, in this passage. Sanctification is the process of, of moving all of our lives into the house of God, the process of cleaning up every room, rehabbing the house in God's grace so that all of our life reflects being lived to the glory of God. As we look at this text this morning, I, wanna, I want us to share in particular about three practices, three practices that Paul points us towards in this passage that will enable us to grow in sanctification. Sanctification doesn't just happen like that. It is a process where we visit and visit and revisit. You know, we're going on to perfection, we like to say in the the Methodist faith. We're going on to. So three practices that Paul points to, three verbs that he uses in this text that are important actions, important steps for us to take uh, to participate and to experience this process of, of becoming dead to sin and alive to Christ. The first one is simply the word no. The word no. Paul said in verses 3 through 7, Don't you know, or don't you know, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Don't you know you've been baptized? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God, of the Father, we too may live a new life. We too may live a new life. And it's clear that part of what he has in mind is what we think of, uh, of, of that practice in water baptism. Now, we're not talking about the, the little drops of water that we place on the, the head of a, of a nice, pretty, bouncing, newborn baby. We're thinking of the practice here of em- totally immersing the, the body under the waters, dying with Christ and being raised again to new life as the baptized person is raised out of the water. It's a symbol of dying with Christ and being raised again to live a new life in Christ. But there is another, there is another New Testament era understanding of baptism and what it means. Set aside for just a moment that whole imagery of water baptism in the Christian faith, the word baptism was also used for the process of taking a piece of cloth, taking a garment that was one color, for instance, let's say an original light brownish color that flax normally comes out, and dipping it into a vat of dye and pulling it out again, and totally changing its character, totally changing its appearance, totally changing its being. 
And that's what's going on here. Paul said, don't you know that you have been dipped in the waters of Christ. You have been dipped in the blood of Jesus, and you are no longer what you used to be. But you need to know that you have now identified yourself with Jesus Christ. The process of sanctification is anchored in and begins with knowing that we have now identified our lives, not with sin, not with rebellion, but know that we have identified our lives with Jesus Christ. We're committed totally with him. Once a garment is put in that vat, it is dyed and it is that color for the rest of its life. In that case, there's no going back. That should be our attitude. That should be what we know, is that we have identified that Christ has died for us on the cross, that we have identified ourselves with that death for us, that he was raised again to life, to live his life to the glory of God, and we identify ourselves with that practice because we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. We know that we have been baptized. We have been dipped. And our lives, our understanding of who we are has been changed. Our understanding of who we are has been changed. I'm no longer committed to being a sinner, but I'm committed to being a saint, to being holy, Devoted to God. The second word that Paul uses in this passage uh, as an aid to uh, to practice, to, to grow in sanctification, is he uses the word count. Count or consider. In verse 11, he says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus. This word count is a word that comes out of finance. It's a word that comes out of bookkeeping. It's a word that comes out of accounting. You've taken into consideration everything, and now write down in the book. Write down in the book. I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to Christ. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Act like it's so. Reckon that it is true. It has been entered into the ledger. I am in Christ. Reckon in your mind, I am dead to sin's power. And Christ is in me, releasing God's new power into my life. The result of this, Paul says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. By counting or considering ourselves dead to sin, we refuse We refuse to let, to obey sin anymore. We're dead to it. And on the flip side, we have enthroned Jesus as the master of our lives. Count yourselves. Write it down in your heart. Write it down in your mind. Reckon that this is who I am. I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ. The third thing that Paul mentions in this passage is offer. He says offer. In verse 13 and 14, he said, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God 
as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Offer, offer, give your life. This is a call for a conscious and continuous presentation of yourself to God. Is a conscious decision, a conscious choice that we make, and it is a continuous choice that we make. Paul spells out two simple commands. On the negative side, he says, stop offering yourself to sin. Stop offering yourself to be an instrument of unrighteousness. Why? Because he says we're no longer slaves to sin. We have been liberated. So we don't need to obey that master anymore. We are Christians. God has liberated us. Rather, on the positive side, we are to continually offer ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Sin shall no longer be our master. We have been liberated and we have attached ourselves to Jesus Christ as our master. We have made Jesus Christ our master. We've offered our lives to God. And again, grace is the key in this. Grace was the key in justification. For it is by grace that you're saved through faith. Grace is the key in sanctification. He says, it's not through the law. This doesn't happen through trying to be good, trying to be better and better. He says, it's through grace. It's because of God's grace that we offer ourselves to God. It's in gratitude and in love and in wonder and awe for what God has done for us that we are willing to offer our lives to God and not offer ourselves to sin any longer. I imagine you've got to be almost living on the dark side of the moon if you haven't heard about HGTV. Is there anybody here that hasn't heard HGTV? Yeah, you know, you know HGTV. And there's all of those programs on HGTV where they take some kind of wreck of an old house and they walk in and they rehab it. They, they walk in and they say, well, that, we're gonna have to take that wall down there. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to take out those covers. We're gonna have to put in new countertops. We're gonna have to totally redo this bathroom. We're just we're gonna we're gonna tear up that carpeting. We're gonna put new uh, laminate. We're gonna put new uh, hardwood floors down there. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. Those that we're gonna tear those bushes down on the outside. We're gonna re-landscape the totally rehabbing the house. That's what the process of sanctification is like. It's totally rehabbing the house of our soul and bringing it and remaking it in God's grace to the glory of God. Totally rehabbing the house for God's glory. Wesley often called this Christian perfection or being made perfect in love. God in his love sees us as perfect. That's the justification aspect of it. And we more perfectly love God. Isn't that the great call of Jesus? Isn't that the great commandment of Jesus to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? Sanctification is growing in our ability to love God with all that we are with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, so that every aspect of this house of who we are is given to God in love, in love. Now, when I watch those, you know, the Property Brothers or uh, uh, 
Chip and Joanna, uh, when I watch those shows, don't they make it look so easy? Any, any idiot can do this. Anybody can go in and just tear down some cupboards and pulverize a bathtub. And any idiot can do that. But not everybody can redo it. <laughs> not everybody. Those are, those are professionals that are doing that. Those are people who are skilled. Those are people who have been trained. Those are craftsmen who are doing it. There is a new show coming out on HGTV called First Time Rehab, where they're going to show all the mistakes that people make, all of the failures that people make in trying to rehab the house. I, just, I say all of that just to say sanctification is not, is not easy. It's not simple. But neither is it impossible. Neither it is, is it impossible. It, as all things, is accomplished by grace through faith. It is accomplished as God's grace works in our lives and empowers us and we believe and commit ourselves to that process. All of our salvation and all of our sanctification or our hope of sanctification is the work of God in us. We either participate with that or we rebel against it. If we participate, we move forward. If we rebel, change does not happen. And in this text, we're reminded of three important practices. Now, close your eyes for a second. Yep. I wasn't sure if I wrote those on the next screen or not. <laughs> we're reminded of three important practices that we can participate in the process of becoming holy, the process of becoming sanctified, the process of committing ourselves completely to loving God to the full. And the first is to know, to identify ourselves as those who have been baptized, those who have been dipped and we're changed. We're changed. We've died to sin and we have been raised to a new life with God in Jesus Christ. Know that. Secondly, to count, to consider ourselves. Write it down on the ledger of your heart, your mind, and your will. I have dethroned Satan. I have dethroned sin. God has dethroned Satan. God has dethroned sin, and I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And God's grace is available if and when I fail. And thirdly, offer. Offer, continue to offer your life to God. Don't offer your life anymore to sin, but offer yourself to God. Grace is the motive for this. Gratitude for God's grace. And God's grace will empower us in this process. Know. Know what you are. Count. Consider yourself to be dead to the old life and alive to the new. And offer yourself continually, consciously to God. There's three important questions that are asked every elder who's being ordained at annual conference about sanctification. The first question is, are you going on to perfection? Are you going on to sanctification? Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? And are you earnestly seeking it? It's not just good for the goose, but it's good for the gander, you know? It's not just good for me, but it's good for all of us. Are you going on 
in the process of sanctification in your lives? Do you expect that you'll grow in that, that you will be made perfect in God's love in this life, and are you earnestly seeking it, earnestly striving after? It's an important work of God in our lives. Salvation is just stepping through the door. You're in. We're in. And I guess we could be content to leave the house a wreck for the rest of our lives. But who really wants to live like that? Sanctification and holiness is giving all of our life, all of our house, all of our soul to God and moving toward God rehabbing in his grace. Seek. Let us be those kinds of Christians who seek to be made perfect in God's love. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that not only do you save our souls from sin, but it is your desire that we go on, that we go on to model that perfection, that we go on to experience and really be liberated from sin and to totally live our lives to your glory. None of this, Lord, we know we can do in our own power. But all is in your grace as we live and move by faith. Let your spirit speak to us, move in us, and enable us to grow in sanctification. To your glory, Lord God. 